Good evening, everyone. I'm Fred, and you're watching Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Uh, if you're watching this live, thanks for joining the stream tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, and tonight would be super serious uh, because we were talking about the use of war game in the military. Uh, so my guess is that fun is probably forbidden from that. But my guest might correct me on this point. We shall see. Uh, I am actually quite excited about this panel um, as I would like to explore for the first time on this channel uh, a bit more about how tabletop war games can be used uh, professionally uh, and not only as a pure um, gaming uh, product. Uh, so to discuss this current state of uh, wargaming in the military, I regrouped a panel of three researchers and analysts uh, from the US and from France, because I wanted to avoid having only an American perspective. Uh, but it's quite hard, actually, I would say, uh, because it seems that the US is pretty advanced on that topic, but also way more open uh, about discussing it uh, publicly. Uh, I think it's a relevant public now, uh, with all, even with all the progress of uh, computer simulation, uh, it seems like more than ever, wargaming is a recurring uh, topic. Uh, you can hear, uh, you can read a lot of articles about it. Well, a lot, but uh, quite a lot of articles about it on War on the Rocks, for example, uh, a really popular defense blog. Uh, but we also see like actual initiatives um, uh, around tabletop wargaming in the uh, military. I think that in 2008, uh, the Chinese Population Liberation Army uh, has opened a wargaming center. Uh, there was an initiative that was launched in 2017 by the Military Academy of the General Staff in Russia. Uh, there were a lot of initiatives happening in the UK. Uh, and even today, I actually saw a job offer for the Danish Navy that is working, war recruiting war gamers uh, for their research center uh, now in 2022. Uh, so that's a, a quite interesting and, and active uh, field. Uh, as usual, if you're watching this live, uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, in the live chat uh, and I'll bring them to the panel. If you see that I don't bring them straight away, that might be because I keep it for a moment uh, that will make more sense because I try to structure the discussion. Uh, so don't be uh, uh, too worried if you don't see your question pop up uh, uh, straight away. But uh, enough about the intro. Uh, I will bring uh, my panel for tonight. And I would start with Sawyer Judge. Hi, Sawyer. Sebastian Bay and Antoine Bourguillot. Thank you very much uh, to the three of you for being here this evening. And uh, well, thanks for being here tonight, but also um, just, a, just, a, just a quick question. How are you feeling? Are you feeling confident about this discussion? Uh, any, or, and, and I know that some of you are actually um, uh, also wondering if we're going to do it for the Super Bowl. So I'm just going to reassure the American audience, but also the panel here. We are going to be aiming at ending in an hour or so. So don't worry too much about that. Good. Uh, great. But um, so if that all sounds good, uh, just a bit of information regarding the structure of the discussion. Uh, the idea is to divide it in three major sections. Uh, first, I would like for us to talk about uh, your own um, trajectory within Wargaming, so how you came to do that, but also what you're doing right now. Um, then I would like us to have an open discussion about what you see is the current state of Wargaming in the US and in France. And finally, open up the conversation at the end um, around what you think is going to be the future of Wargaming in the, in the short term. Does that sound good to all of you? Yeah. Yes. Great. Just a, a note to both of you, uh, Sawyer and Sebastian, you are muted. So just in case, if you were about to say something, uh, you're there. Uh, cool. Uh, and I'm going to check. I see that there is actually a lot of uh, people in the chat. And we have even Philippe Lepinard from Leo. So that's really great. Also someone who's working in on the academic field uh, on gaming, but more in the management uh, part. So that's interesting to see that. Uh, we have also some war gaming, uh, gaming professionals here tonight, so that's really nice. Kabuki Kid, uh, Niels also, thank you for being here. Uh, so good evening, everyone. So I guess we can start, uh, if that's okay with you, and maybe just to um, give a bit of context to the viewers here, uh, I would ask uh, each of you maybe to present yourself briefly, um, and we'll start with you, uh, Sawyer, and then I will do uh, clockwise, if that's okay. So Sebastian, get ready, you're the next one, yeah. Certainly. Thanks, Fred. Uh, right. So my name is Sawyer Judge. I've been doing professional war game design for almost two years now. Um, I focused on it um, sort of intentionally in grad school when I was at Georgetown University in the School of Foreign Service. And I fell into it. And part of that is Sebastian's fault because he was actually my professor at Georgetown. 
Um, and I remember having tried a lot of different things and I was frustrated because I wasn't finding um, my medium. I wasn't finding a way to combine analysis and creativity and what I loved about board games, but um, with my interest in the military and national security, I came from a military family. And so I really wanted to do something um, in support of that effort. And it was a weekend talk that Sebastian was giving about the basics of war game. And I stumbled into it and I went, oh my gosh, this is it. Uh, and since then, I've just been relentlessly pursuing it, wrote my thesis on it, designed my first game in grad school, and I continue to work on it professionally. Um, it's, it's a fantastic line of work. And I I'm looking forward to spending my whole career doing it. That's great. What was the thesis about? My thesis was, so my thesis was on more the epistemology of war game design. It was about the standards of practice um, that result in the products rather than the products itself. And I created a metric um, based on a bunch of different sort of bodies of literature to try to figure out whether the standards of practice in designing were more similar to scientific academic disciplines or artistic ones. Um, so I looked a lot at the field of artistic research. Um, I looked at the basics of scientific theory and like how experiments are designed and sort of took what I knew from practitioners in the field and other wargaming, professional wargaming literature and did a cross-examination. Um, it was a really fun experiment. Um, I've definitely had some people say, well, that sounds a little like a semantic argument, but I would say that it is important because it helps the field frame how the way it talks about its products, how it defines war game design. And that really can help our sponsors when we can speak confidently about what war game design is and isn't, especially in a professional context. Okay, but that's that's really like fascinating. Is there is the, the thesis um, publicly available or... It's within the Georgetown Library, and so you can request it from the university, but it has not been published anywhere beyond the university. Okay, great. But thanks for uh, for all that. Um, and now uh, up to you, Sebastian. Yeah, so my name is Sebastian Bay. I am a research analyst and game designer at the Center for Naval Analysis, also known as CNA. Uh, Sawyer, Sawyer, Sawyer and I work on the gaming integration team, which is our primary focus is designing games for our sponsors, which can range from government agencies to military services. Um, I also teach a game design course at Georgetown at the graduate level called Basics of Wargaming. I also teach similar courses or have in the past at the US Naval Academy and uh, the US Marine Corps Command and Staff College. Great, thanks Sebastian. And last but not least, <laughs> Antoine Bourguillot. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, so my name is Antoine Bourguillot. Um, I'm a researcher at Paris uh, One University at La Sorbonne. And uh, so I published last year a book about uh, the history of war games, which was the first um, book written in French about this matter. And uh, yes, it is. Thank you, sir. And uh, I also do work uh, with the military. It's been more than a, more than a year now. More specifically, uh, with the French Army Staff College, uh, where I'm working as a wargaming war gaming designer uh, with trainees uh, that are uh, at, the, at the French Army Staff College and then go to the French Staff College. Um, and we designed uh, a war game uh, about what we call high intensity warfare, uh, la guerre de haute intensité in French, because uh, it was there was a general feeling uh, in the French Army Staff College that um, all the um, the main all the course uh, during this year at the um, at the Staff College uh, was rather uh, too theoretical and not enough practical. So they really wanted to to have a tool to to train to train and to uh, to, to think and to to have some exchanges about uh, doctrine and about tactics and. Uh, they felt that war game was a personal tool, so uh, that's why I jumped in. And uh, so we we built a war game last year. Uh, the new promotion, uh, I've used it quite intensely because uh, there was more than 100 games that were played with the rules. And so uh, we also plan to to have them released in a, in a very short period, I, I hope so, maybe maybe in, in late in, in this year. Uh, we'll see that. But so uh, 
contrary to to Sawyer and Sebastian, we I, mean, I am not integrated into uh, what I would call a, a lab or something like that. There is no such things at the moment. Uh, I'm working hard to 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 make it happen in the French military. Uh, we have lots of private uh, actors, contractors working, designing games for the army, but currently uh, no real structure inside uh, the department, the French Department of Defense. Okay, but thanks for, for that. And I think it's already a, an interesting information that you're noting around uh, some of the differences that you see between um, how uh, the activity is being developed in the US and the number of actors like um, Sawyer and Sebastian were talking about uh, a lot of different sponsors for, for the projects. It looks like already in France, it's a, it may be a bit more limited at this stage, but that's also something that I would like to uh, to discuss a bit more in the, in the second part of that discussion. Uh, without making it too personal, there is one thing that I would like to, to know, because obviously that's a question that comes up, making that decision of doing your career in, in game design even for, for a professional, uh, in a professional perspective, raises the question of your own experience with, with gaming. Uh, how uh, important it is in your personal life? Did you grow up with it uh, and everything? And I'm going to start with you, Sebastian, because on your channel uh, for, for, for Georgetown, you invited a lot of commercial designers. So the question is, obviously, I, I wanted to know you as a as as a player, did it have a, uh, a role or an impact on the on the choice that you made of of pursuing that specific area right now? So personally, um, I was a hobby gamer um, as a uh, growing up. I played hobby games, the Avalon Hill games. You know what I mean? I grew up playing Risk, Assassin and Allies, and so forth. And I'm still a pretty avid uh, you know board game player myself. I love you know pretty crunchy hex encounter games up to you know I mean some Euro games as well. But as a career, I didn't know professional wargaming was a possibility. Uh, it wasn't, you know, I mean, a choice that I knew or a career that I knew was available to me. Um, like most professional wargamers, at least in the states, we—I uh, was one of the many who fell into it. So I enlisted in the Marine Corps out of high school, went to college and graduate school. And after graduate school, I was actually pursuing some writing and hoping to work for the State Department. Uh, but at the same time, I was, you know, I mean, in between jobs and was waiting for my offer to start at State Department. And um, I was actually in Kurdistan covering a story for Foreign Policy Magazine as a freelancer. And I was like terribly sick. I was like, God, this is a terrible way of life. I can't do this. I need a real job. And so I looked up uh, defense jobs, um, looking to, you know, to pivot away from your know, defense journalism. And I found Wargaming um, as an analyst down at Quantico's for the Marine Corps Wargaming Lab, uh, also known as a Wargaming Division, which is a subset organization of that. And then I applied. They asked me if I can come uh, next week for an interview. I was still in Kurdistan and Iraq at the time. I was like, can I come a bit later? Uh, so I, ca I caught a flight, returned back to D.C. and sort of started my professional career there. Um, I was a hobby gamer already. I had some knowledge from my days as an enlisted Marine uh, in the infantry. But my real sort of you know, conversion into the professional realm started there where I sort of started learning how to design games for the military on the job. And it was great to have my combination of hobby gaming as a background because it made me understand how games work, uh, what makes games interesting and fun and engaging, but also combining sort of the research and analytical skills that I had in grad school and undergrad. So it was a great little merger of those two things. Great. And and for you, Sawyer, was it something that, that you, you, you did you used to play before or is it something that you actually developed when, when you decided that uh, that was a, a career that you wanted to pursue? I think it's, it's more fair to say of my experience that um, I decided to dive into it very quickly once I knew it was an option for me. Um, my family did love playing games growing up. Um, I remember playing a lot of Monopoly and some more what I would classify as maybe um, the kinds of board games that you can buy at Target, right? Uh, more like classic games. And I did love them, but I wasn't a full-blown hobby gamer. Um, I didn't really find out about games like Axis and Allies and, and some that I think have a lot more popularity in wargaming circles until I was in grad school finding out about wargaming for the first time. And so what draw it I think what drew me to it was less of a hobbyist background and more 
of this desire to be creative. And, and I just love different methodologies so much. And I thought that Wargaming was such an exciting way of expressing uh, that creative instinct in a way that was really helpful and analytical. Um, and so it was just something that really appealed to me. And it really appealed to the way that my brain works. I'm a very visual thinker. Um, my office is just full with like post-it notes and I really can't express my thoughts without drawings and doodles. And I found that war game design appealed to that way of thinking in a really unique way for me. And I was just hooked. But since then, my board game collection has definitely grown substantially. <laughs> Good. And is there like any specific uh, games or system that particularly uh, struck you or like inspired you in your uh, in your in, that, in, in your process of getting into wargaming? Sure. I remember um, Pandemic was the first sort of uh, collective or collaborative war game that I played. Um, and I haven't played it in two years because it feels a little too soon now. Um, but before the pandemic, I really enjoyed playing it because I loved the mechanic, uh, the sort of seamless mechanic of populating an epidemic. Um, the thought, the way that they used the card deck and, uh, and everything else was sort of seamless, easy, intuitive for people who maybe are not um, avid uh, hobbyist gamers. That's really important to me when I look for board games is that it's something that my family and friends who are not board game enthusiasts would still be willing to play. And so I think that that's really a beautiful art if you find a game that is both complicated and satisfying to people who would be content to spend multiple hours on a game, but isn't intimidating for people who might not. Um, and so that is one that I really enjoy. And I also have a, a dear love for Evolution Climate, which I think is both aesthetically pleasing, but also the right amount of complex, simple rules, lots of options for decision making. And that is really, I think, the hallmark of a good game design. Great, thanks. And Antoine, I'm asking the question, but I know the answer. So I will tell you, try to be short, Antoine, because Antoine has a lot to say about gaming. And this is not a miniatures channel, so be careful. You're on yeah. thin ice. Thin I, ice. I, must, I must confess, well, I, I am also, uh, I am a miniature war gamer uh, indeed, and I, I particularly enjoy all the systems made by Sam Mustafa, uh, which has lots of uh, things that were taken, I think, from his extensive use of board games. And he really renewed uh, the thing, the whole thing. But actually, uh, just like Sebastian says, uh, I was also a hobby, ga uh, hobby gamer, lots of X encounters, um, more lately, uh, Euro games. Um, the, the thing that strikes me the most is, well, actually, I discovered the existence of war games when I was 16. I was going into a museum. It was about the First World War. And uh, at the end of the museum, uh, there was a, a box of uh, a French war game, which was called La Bataille de la Marne, the Battle of the Marne, which was obviously uh, uh, a game about uh, from Jeux Descartes, which was the, one of the first French publishers uh, in the late, uh, in late 70s, early 80, 80s. And uh, so I was absolutely flabbergasted by, by this view. Uh, I, I just could not believe that it was possible to uh, play about history. And uh, I think that um, one, of, one, one thing that really strikes me is that lots of people actually do not play war games because just, they just don't know war games exist, actually. So we are basically we are in a niche. And I'm very struck by the fact that, for instance, uh, in the French army, uh, I've been meeting more than uh, two or three or four hundreds of uh, trainees at the um, at the staff college, and there are not very much lots of people who actually have ever played uh, war games. Maybe like ten percent. So uh, it strikes me that in the military in France, well, most people have heard of war games, but almost none has ever played a, a real war game. Yeah, and that's an interesting topic. I think even in, in even in board gaming, sometimes it's a it's a part of the hobby that is pretty unknown. And for a lot of people, uh, and like when we mention war games, often they think about miniature war games. They don't know that there are games like, for example, Twilight Struggle that are on a completely different level that are actually talking about international relations and not specifically about the battle. So that's um, and I yeah, and I expected at least in the military a, a better knowledge of it because as the the story of history of war gaming and history of military, at least for the last 150 years or pretty connected, you could expect a bit more knowledge, but yeah. Anyway, 
So that was it for the personal stuff. Uh, it's already 20 minutes in, so I mean, probably should get moving and get into the, the actual uh, um, uh, center of the, uh, of the topic. Um, and um, maybe, uh, maybe a, first, a first question uh, to, to, to you, Antoine, because now I would like to discuss about the current state of, of, of war games, but also how uh, it can be used. So as you were saying, you're actually, you have a bit two different position. On one hand, you're working with the French military, but on the other, you're at La Sorbonne, so doing historical research. Uh, and in, intuitively, you can understand how war gaming can be useful in the context of, of uh, training officers or within the context of the military, because it, 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 like it, it makes sense. But I was wondering, in the context, as a historical researcher, do you feel like wargaming can be a tool to explore and better understand specific battles, for example, for which we lack uh, sources or, you know, or things like this? Do you feel like the two interact with each other, that wargaming can be a tool both for historical research, but also um, in the military as an analysis tool? Well, I, I would say that uh, basically wargaming can be a, a very pertinent tool uh, if you if you apply it correctly to the to the um, uh, to the specifics you are looking at uh, about history. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it really can you know help you to make uh, you have a sideway look on your matter. So uh, you're not only into uh, well when you want to, to talk about a battle, uh, usually you describe a battle, but if you want to make a game about a battle, you have to not to produce uh, a thread, you have not to produce a text, but you have to produce some matter for a story. So you don't tell a story, you give the tools, you, you give people tools to, to, you know, to get their own story right about the thing. And one of the things that strikes me the most um, when I'm thinking about war games and history is that uh, the use of dice, cards, whatsoever, tends to randomize things. And so you have usually, you know, almost every battle has its salient points. You know, uh, you have the picket charge uh, at Gettysburg. You have the story of the, the French old guard uh, charging at uh, the Battle of, of Waterloo, whatsoever. Almost every battle, uh, you know, makes this kind of anecdotal uh, elements, and probability that you will have the same moment at the same time with the same unit uh, in a war game is pretty scarce. And to me, it is very important uh, as a historian because it shows you what is important and what is not. And if you can replace one of the most iconic moments of a battle by another battle that will become iconic because you played it and it was the turning point, it tends to, you know, to uh, allow you to think about the high tendencies and not to be too, too uh, obsessed by some specifics, uh, you know, glory things uh, that are usually... Uh, the most thing, the most prominent things uh, when you think about uh, um, a, a battle. So that's for the historical part. Um, for the military part, I think I lost my uh, thought. And, the, and that's fine. And I can I can actually ask the question to to uh, to, to to Sawyer also, but uh, maybe to to reframe it because I wanted to have your historical point of view, but from a like you could say more of a defense and analyst point of view. And I think there is a question that really goes into that direction in the chat. Uh, and and I would ask you that question. So you're so what do you think I can like what kind of insights can be generated from a, like the context of war gaming as an output of war gaming that you think can be hard or uh, more complicated to get from uh, either science or social science. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm actually really passionate about the answer for this question because I think it's important to be able to speak to the value add of wargaming, especially when you're having a conversation with someone who either is just unfamiliar with it or is skeptical of it. Um, I think wargaming comfortably creates a bridge between a lot of the social science applications that want to focus on the role that people play, but also the analytical role that we, or the analytical products that we often want to get out of more hard science and objective applications. But truly the value add comes from the way that war games look at the human decision-making process as an input. Um, there aren't a lot of methodologies I've come across that do a better job of allowing the personality and the 
mental process and the factors that are important in human decision making and the individuals who are playing your game to really be a part of the process of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, we have to take the human element of war and other problems that we look at into account. And what better way to do that than to actually set up some sort of, I hesitate to use the word model, but a capture of a problem and of reality and to pose those, those difficult decisions to people um, and to look at their response and to be able to say, this is presenting us a possibility that needs further exploration. Um, I love to say that the other value add beyond the way that war games enable us to look at the human decision-making process, another value add truly is um, the, how do I wanna say this? It's the unique way that we can look at next questions. It's the way that we can look at not what future will happen, but we can have a broader sort of wider cast look at the possibilities of futures that may occur. Um, and we can be very specific in and intentional in the next questions that we ask. We can turn it over to more traditional forms of analysis and put wargaming and other methodologies into conversation. And I think that really enriches problem solving for the military overall. And, and in your perspective, Sebastian, and maybe just from, uh, uh, so if, if I understood correctly, Sebastian, you were a Marine before uh, as a first part of your career. And I was wondering, like Sawyer was talking about uh, on an individual level, making people part of the process. And that's really important. I was thinking, well, were you as a Marine exposed to wargaming? Uh, so being on the other side, not being the designer, but actually the receiver of the design. And, and if you did, how did your perspective change when you actually shifted to being the person that is actually creating those exercises? And, and what do you think really, what kind of value do you get on both ends of the, uh, of the, of the war game design process? So as a enlisted Marine, I will be honest and say that my experience with war games in uniform was pretty limited. Uh, the principal way we engage with games was what we call TDGs or tactical decision games. And they're not real true games because they're not truly interactive. Uh, tactical decision games for those who are not familiar are really problem sets like, think of, like math problems, but for tactics. So they're usually one page sort of scenarios that says, hey, you have to take this bunker on this hill. You're a squad leader. Uh, how do you go about it? And it's usually as a framed as a problem that you uh, discuss orally with your teammates, with your mentors, with other tactical leaders. It's a way for tactical expertise to be passed on from uh, different ranks, and but also among your peers. Uh, but it's not a true game because red is sort of scripted and it's not uh, interactive and dynamic. But we still call them games because there are uh, they, there are ways to make them more interactive. There are other tools, what we call operational war game decision sets or decision uh, scenarios or decision decision games. Uh, the other way was actually just playing board games in the barracks, right? So a bunch of enlisted Marines get lots of time off uh, when you're stuck on base and you don't have a car. So we played a lot of board games and got pretty rowdy at times. But that's really the predominant ways that we engage with war, uh, games, at least on the enlisted side. Uh, unfortunately, even for the officer side, uh, uh, having been the designer of games, um, the officers usually don't engage with games very early in their career. They get small glimpses and touches with games, but it's not a recurring thing that throughout their career or their professional military education or what we call PME. Um, so there, you know, there's a lot of ways we can do that better in my opinion. Um, but you know, as a enlisted Marine, I didn't really get to touch games a lot, but it's, so it's one of those things that I want to do more is to get games in the hands of officers and enlisted more often, both for education and analysis. And, and just to build upon that answer, Sebastian, uh, in your current work and in the work that you're doing with Sawyer, uh, depending on who you are aiming the, uh, the game at, how do you uh, change the design approach? And I think the question from Kevin here actually sums that up. So are professional war games for serving officers matched by their rank and responsibilities? So do you adapt the design, the level of decision making that you're asking from the players based on the, the concrete experience that they will have? Or, do you, or is it more flexible than that? So uh, taking the first crack at this is most of our games uh, fit into two broad categories, which is analytical and educational. Um, 
and there are more subcategories, but to think about it more broadly for the first, uh, for those who are new to this field of professional gaming, that's the best way to think about it. Analytical games are designed for producing new uh, knowledge or producing new uh, analysis in support of a wider cycle of research that includes other methods of analysis and exercises that helps you get to a better, more co comprehensive analysis and assessment of a particular problem set. These sort of anal uh, analytical games are usually done for organizations and uh, services and uh, senior, uh, se uh, senior decision makers. So I think the uh, you know, high levels of the Navy deciding on a particular problem or the Marine Corps or so forth. Um, in terms of educational games, this is sort of what you know, what the question sort of hinted at is, are there educational games uh, sort of marketed or tailored to specific ranks and specific problems? And the answer is a uh, lukewarm a little bit. <laughs> so for example, in the Marine Corps, there are a series of games that are used educationally and more so in the past uh, couple years. In the last probably five years, educational gaming has been gaining more steam. For instance, uh, one of the first inter uh, interactions with games that most officers will get is what we call the STEXES, uh, which is done at the basic school uh, for Marine Corps officers. Uh, STEXES stand for sand table exercises, and they're not true, you know what I mean, rigid games in the sense of board games, but they use sand tables to allow them to explore sort of squad, but also platoon level or even company level tactics. And it's done as a group and is in, uh, it's really sort of a series of tactical decisions that they have to walk through. And it's uh, it's quite immersive at times, depending, uh, depending on the facilitator, they can make it really dynamic and engaging for them. There are pieces on the sand table that are moved about. Uh, sometimes they use little army men uh, when, they, when they are missing pieces or they need certain types of pieces um in the past they were more uh, uh structured types of games in the marine corps back in the 60s 70s and 80s and even into the early 90s before the first gulf war they had a system of games called tac war uh which was based on uh an analytical game called the landing forces uh uh, war game, which was later redeemed into the TAC War family of games, which had different types of games for different types of uh, commands and sort of uh, leadership. So TAC War was the one for a sort of company and battalion level. There were Steel Thrust, Warfare, which were uh, at higher levels of what they call the MAW and the MEF, uh, or the MAF at the time, MAF, uh, which are now referred to as the MU and the MEF, which are the Marine Expeditionary Unit and the Marine uh, Expeditionary Force. So there are different types of educational games in the past that uh, were targeted at specific demographics. And even today, there are games like OWS, which was designed by Colonel Tim Barrett, at the Marine Corps War Fighting Lab and the War Gaming Division, which is more geared towards command and staff level majors, lieutenant colonels who are looking at staff problems. Um, for example, my own game, Littoral Commander, is more aimed at you know captains and below, right? And there's uh, and there are enlisted uh, units that are looking at sort of the battalion, regiment, company level of, of command. So there are different games. Uh, command General Staff uses several other games that are both commercial and its own game. It has a divisional game called Land Power that it uses for staff sort of level combat. But each of these systems have different abstractions and different compromises depending on their demographic. And you, so you, you mentioned something that I was interested uh, to, to talk about also, and that's the influence of commercial gaming into your own activities as, as professional war gamers. And maybe you, I'll start with you, Antoine, just to better understand how uh, do you see the two interact with each other. So as you were saying, like in France, it's not that necessarily developed yet, but uh, do you feel like commercial war game can serve as a basis that you can build upon? How do you see that relationship uh, uh, growing uh, for you, but also in general within the within the whole field? Uh, ju just one, just before that, I would just I would just like to you know first say that I was I totally agreed with what Judge said about the uh, uh, the benefits of using war games. Uh, uh, I'm totally on this uh, on the same line, and I would also uh, second. Uh, what Sebastian just uh, just said about the fact that we need to to have more enlisted and junior officer uh, using war games. Uh, for my specific case, I'm so I am the, at the French Army Staff College. Most of the um, the officers uh, are uh, majors, commandant in uh, in the French Army, and uh, maybe I think it's it's a bit late. So uh, I would also add just one thing: is that uh, in my view, because it was the, one of the questions, uh, wargaming is definitely not a thing to forecast things. I think it. I, I personally, I really see it as a way to ask yourself questions 
perhaps you never asked yourself this way. Um, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that war games can produce the answers. It can produce lots of questions. And then you have to, to carry on and think about the questions that were raised by the, by the war game and try to find answers and maybe to make another war game to, to see if your answers are correct or not. To, 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 to talk about more specifically about your questions uh, about uh, um, the, the joint, maybe some kind of joint ventures, uh, you have the French company, which is called Nuts. And uh, Nuts has produced many war games that were designed, in fact, by uh, French military officers, uh, Urban Ops, uh, and uh, also, I think, uh, Phantom Fury about Battle of Fallujah. Uh, Urban Ops was created by uh, um, a French officer and has been used uh, as such uh, by him in, in some instances inside the French army or sometimes with allied armies. Uh, so there is uh, lots of, you know, relations between uh, the military and uh, we have, for instance, also uh, a French company, which is called Pitarek, uh, who does uh, lots of serious games. So we are not more on war games, but more on serious games and do work for uh, the French Department of Defense. So uh, I'm producing usually things like more matrix games, uh, not more kinetic, not more kinetic um, war games. Uh, so there is a circulation. Um, Actually, we are discussing to uh, to to have uh, this this war game that was made by the the trainees of the French Army Staff College by Nuts and with Nuts. Um, so we are discussing uh, this matter on this very moment. So uh, I hope that uh, it will carry on. But for the moment, uh, I must say that uh, there is no structures like like the CNA that has really got a hold on war gaming. It has taken a hold in the French, uh, in the French army, that's for sure. Um, a little more, also a little bit also uh, in the French air force, uh, and really not uh, paradoxically uh, in the French marine national, so in the French navy. Um, lots of people are talking about it's it's a huge tendency for like one or two years. Lots of people in the institution are you know saying. We should make war games. We should do war games. We should, you know, war game, war game. And people talk a lot about war games, but really, in fact, nobody really do war game, uh, and certainly not uh, on, um, uh, I would say, um, on a systematic basis. So we at the Ecole de Guerre, so the French Army Staff College. In my uh, in my researches, I think it's the only time that uh, it's for the first time in the French uh, in the French army, um, it war gaming was inside um, the, the the main the course of the first year uh, of training in inside the, the French army staff college. It, it, it it's the first time that it is inside. Lots of people have been playing war games uh, outside and uh, on their free time told us but not inside uh and with the teachers so it's the first time and, i guess and and for, for on an american on the american side so so you're, how do you see that interaction between commercial and 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 military uh level of of war gaming because it was interesting to say that antoine was saying that on one hand there are some publishers that are making games for the military so from like as an external consultant but also that potentially games that are made within the context of uh, by analysts might be published also by by publishers, so there is this interaction. Is there something like this uh, in in happening also in the U.S.? I, I yes, I think Sebastian can speak to this perhaps even better than I can, um, because he is a little bit more plugged in. I believe, and Sebastian, I don't need to call you out on this, but perhaps more plugged into the, what is happening in the commercial war game design development world in the U.S. than I am. Um, but I can speak to how important playing commercial games is for professional war game designers. Um, we definitely, as part of, I can particularly speak to the aspect of training to be a professional war game designer. Um, a large part of that is encouragement from people who are more senior than myself saying, hey, let's get together and let's play some board games and let's break them apart and let's talk about how different mechanics that are present in commercial games might have value to what we do professionally. And so 
um, at a minimum, I think the overlap between the commercial and the professional world is a very important part of the dialogue and is an important part of um, how we think about designing games as a practice and as a method. So there's definitely an influence there. And Sebastian, do you want to add something to that? Knowing that you just uh, have one of your projects being added, but uh, it's to the pre-order of a, of a new publisher? You might... Yeah, so I'll try not to be so self-promotional, but uh, <laughs> there is a lot of inter uh, engagement between the commercial realm and um, professional wargaming. Many professional wargamers who work for DoD will make their own games. Like, for example, Volko Ruhinki, who wrote the Coin series. He was a longtime CIA analyst, although his job wasn't uh, professional wargame design for the CIA. Uh, there are others like uh, colleagues of mine at RAN uh, in the past who helped out design games or served at play testers. Um, Mitch Reed over at Headquarters Air Force. He is an uh, avid commercial game designer uh, designer and sort of um, member of the community over at No Das No Glory. And there are a couple other people who are designing games as well, like Dave Thompson uh, and so forth. Uh, but and you know, like myself, I've recently in, in the process of publishing Littoral Commander, which is about future warfare for the Marine Corps or uh, naval infantry, I guess is the best way to put it <laughs> uh, to avoid being in trouble, um, is um, also being published by the Diaz Foundation. But there's a lot of you know, going back and forth. Um, and a lot of times we apply what we learned as commercial designers and commercial hobby game design, uh, uh, players to our own professional realm. Uh, we take our ideas, but we also twist, uh, twist and adapt them as we need because you know professional games have different uh, needs than commercial ones, right? Commercial ones usually are like um, you know two to five players, but with some of our professional games, they can go up to 200 people, right? Uh, who have a vast deeper knowledge about some of our things that we're talking about. And sometimes they don't. So you have to uh, look at a wide range of things of how to engage your players and what mechanics are useful and what mechanics have to be adapted. And I wanted to, to building upon that, like the influence of, of uh, mechanics that come from the commercial world. And there was something that you were mentioning, um, uh, Sawyer, around the level of complexity of some of the mechanics. I was wondering from, from your perspective, is there a risk of making war games too complex for participants to really engage in the game more than engage in the, in, or being burdened by the cognitive load of actually understanding the system? And how do you balance that? That's a really good question. I think what I've noticed from my time as a professional war game designer is that um, unlike unlike a moment where you might be teaching a commercial game, let's say you get a bunch of friends together and you're going to take a game out of a box and you're going to pull out a rule book and you're going to learn it either together or you're going to rely on the person who owns the game to have studied the rule book and to sort of facilitate it for everyone. There's a little bit more reliance on how things are already baked into the game. Um, professional war games, um, just as a, a result of time and resources, don't look like pull right out of the box and play games quite as much, uh, or at least it's rare that they do. And so you find a lot of weight placed on the art of facilitation. And so a lot of times with our games, I believe that the danger of complexity is mitigated somewhat by the skills of the professional war game facilitator. Um, they can adapt on the fly. They can see where there are parts of the game design that might be confusing. They were the designer. They know that's coming. They can step in and they can really help move that conversation forward. And in some cases they can tinker with the design as it's being played, building the plane as it's flying. Um, and that can often happen because sometimes there'll be uh, a player wants to make a decision that um, didn't come up in play testing. And so you need to adapt. And I think that that's a critical part of how professional war game design works. What you're saying now actually sounds a lot like being a dungeon master at <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, and uh, yeah, I guess there's, yeah. And then that that that's actually a good transition for me because there is obviously the elephant in the room. We're talking about tabletop war games, but obviously the army has invested, and I, I know it's the case in France, and I'm pretty sure it's the case in the US, in computer simulation. Uh, and and how do you see the advantage of uh, tabletop uh, tabletop wargaming? 
um, uh, compared to uh, compared to computer simulations that exist. And I guess that a lot of officers are being trained on. Uh, and maybe going back on, on the other side of the, the ocean for, for, for that one, and I will go back to the US afterwards. Uh, Antoine, I know that, for example, I think the, the current system in France is uh, SULT, based on the, the SWORD uh, software. Uh, and it's a software that we see in other armies. I think in, in, they have the same base software in, in, in Brazil, it's just that their version is called Combate or something like this. But like they, the army invested a lot in, in computer simulation for, for war games. Where do you think that tabletop wargaming plays a role? How it differentiates uh, from from uh, from those solutions that exist already? Well, actually, because uh, we have a real problem here, uh, which is uh, tabletop wargame as really really suffers from this. What uh, I think it's uh, Phil Sabins uh, talked about the stigmata of uh, of tabletops, and particularly about you know. Uh, dice, the use of dice and the use of cards, which is considered by many people and many people who watch the games as not serious. So what is serious is a very costly simulation. Um, you know, a well, board... Antoine, Antoine uh, I'm sorry, yeah. but you're, you're cutting off a lot. I don't know. I think you might have a, an internal connection problem. I don't know if you can do anything about okay. it. But uh, in the meantime, I will I will ask the question back to Sebastian, and I will come back to you afterwards, Antoine, if you can. Okay, yeah, so, okay. so, uh, on, so yeah, Sebastian, around the the, the interconnection between uh, yeah the the place for the two computer simulation on one side and 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 uh, tabletop war gaming on the other. So the discussion about tabletop manual gaming um, versus you know digital computer games is a, it's a very hot contentious debate in our community which is the future which ones how much should we be digitizing uh, and in or at least in the professional realm there are advantages of not being digital uh, one of them is the classification issues where we can bring a tabletop game that we've designed uh, into a uh, classified room make it classified and then you know strip it down uh, and move it that is much harder in a technology way is also easier to uh, manipulate, change, or adapt the manual game uh, with that has physical cards or pieces versus trying to um, uh, fix or uh, uh, line and programming or you know I mean trying to fix or change how a, a digital uh, simulation game works, right? But at the same time, there are a lot of perks, right? You can get a lot more runs. Distributive gaming is much easier, especially in the sort of COVID pandemic world that we're exi uh, existing in now. Um, there, are, there is also a big trend to adopt digital games, uh, or at least some form of digital gaming, both for education and analysis. Uh, the Air Force has leaned heavily into Command PE, and there are a bunch of pre uh, presentations online that you can look to find that, uh, but more about that. There are other platforms like uh, the Marine Corps University's uh, Krulak Center has been using the Operation Art of War uh, number four uh, to look at some educational purposes as well for their PME uh, educational purposes. Uh, so there's a lot of give and take. Uh, with what the future holds really is, a, I think, a personal conviction for various designers. Um, and I'll you know, toss it over to Sori if she has any more thoughts on those. Yes, yeah, so what's your personal conviction, Sawyer, around this? <laughs> I, so I, I think that Sebastian did a pretty good job of summarizing the, the debate in the current community. Um, personally, I, 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 like Sebastian, have seen the constraints that exist around trying to do, um, to go digital with wargaming. And I also think that whenever you try to do distributed wargaming or digital wargaming, and we have been forced to, to sort of look into that more as a result of the pandemic, um, I think the risk that you run is you're losing some of the conversation that just happens naturally in the room. Um, and I think that that piece of it is really critical. There is just something about having people together and in the same physical space, um, leaning over the, the map, the board, whatever it may be, um, and being able to, particularly for our rapporteurs and our note takers, capture the side conversations that happen, capture the whirling of the brains that goes on over coffee on breaks um, where people are discussing and debating and interacting with the game. Um, and that piece of it, I, I haven't seen how you can really effectively capture that in the digital setting. And so I think there will always be a demand um, for the in-person wargame experience. Um, so I, I, I hope that that answers the question. 
Yeah, it does. And it's it's really interesting what you're saying, because on one hand, you could argue that on the computer side, well, you have a lot of advantages. You can simulate a lot more. You don't have cognitive load because the system is integrated by the computer. You can have the full fog of war. There is a lot of things. But then again, you don't have that human aspect that I guess that is the key of decision making in moments of tension as well. How do you communicate information? How do you come to a decision and everything? So it makes a it makes a lot of sense. Going back to you, Antoine, hoping that the connection is better because you were saying something really interesting around the stigmata of gaming and how it can be uh, badly perceived within a professional uh, context, playing with cards, rolling a dice. Uh, that looks a bit dirty. It doesn't look serious. And worse of all, it's cheap and cheap is doesn't look serious at all. So, so what's yeah. what's yeah. So yeah, I hope uh, the connection is better. Uh, it, looks, it looks good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So uh, I totally second what ju what Judge and, and what and uh, what Sawyer, sorry, and uh, and Sebastian just said. Um, yes. The thing is, there is a huge stigma about the use of dice or cards uh, that are not considered as something serious. Uh, in the beginning, when we were trying to uh, to create this war game at the Ecole de Guerre, many people asked us. Two questions. First, could we do without any dice or cards? And second, wouldn't it be better if we have a digital um, program about this? Because it looked serious, because you know it's digital, it's professional. And so we really had to insist on exactly what uh, Sebastian and Sawyer just said, that uh, in fact, it's very easy. It's so easy to, uh, you know, if you think something doesn't work, you can change it really quickly. Uh, everybody's around the, the, everybody's around the board, so there is lots of interactions, and even, and so you can also discuss the modelization and the, the, the rules. And if you don't agree with rules, well, you're talking about tactics, you're talking about doctrine, and that's exactly what we want. So uh, I, I mean that. Showing everybody that the rules are just a modelization or a way of thinking about the, the war is represented, and to allow people to you, to have a critical view of the way we represent and uh, this specific aspect of war, uh, I think it's really one of the main pluses of um, manual war games. Um, so, and I, but we, I really had to fight and fight and fight again uh, about this. But I think everybody's got it now. So, well, it worked. But, good, but keep on fighting. <laughs> That's, uh, oh, well. that be the, the, we oh, hope well. you do, uh, and we support you, Antoine, a moral support. Uh, but then maybe to, to close a bit that, because we're getting really close to an hour already, it's going extremely fast. Uh, just a, a, a one last question about the current state of Wargaming, and, and that would be a, a question um, around, what kind of topics are you being asked by your sponsors to um, to uh, to actually game on? Because we talked about uh, kinetic war for warfare and things like this, but obviously there are a lot of other topics uh, that could be uh, relevant. Uh, I think um, it could be insurrection warfare or just a civilian uprising or the emergence of a crisis like a migrant crisis, for example, like we've seen in Eastern Europe uh, quite recently, or those topics that are being addressed that the sponsors are asking uh, games for. Uh, and re really having this whole discussion around, well, it's not only about wargaming, but also about peace gaming. How do you uh, create systems around how do you maintain peace? How do you escalate tension? So really curious about the kind of topics that you are being, so not without being specific, but just the, the categories of, 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 uh, of subjects that you're being asked to, to work on. And I would like to, to, to start with you, Sawyer. Um, I might be coming from a bit of a unique perspective on this, and thank you for asking this question. Um, so within the Center for Naval Analysis, I actually sit in an interesting place because I split my time 50-50 with the integration and gaming team where Sebastian is, where the war game design is really done, and with the organizational um, analysis team. So that team is looking more at things like organizational structures, um, command and control, uh, right-sizing organizations, streamlining processes. And both of these teams actually have a tremendous amount of overlap. And so a lot of the wargaming type questions or categories that come across my desk are a blend of both of those. It's people coming and having questions about, you know, we either want to do something different with our organization, we want to explore, uh, we're looking for solutions. We get that question a lot. 
Um, and much as the point was made earlier, it's really important to understand that war games do not predict the future. They can explore possibilities. They can give us next questions. They cannot predict the future. They also cannot necessarily design solutions. They can examine the parameters for a solution. They can uh, explore the requirements for you to think about what kinds of solutions might work in the face of a problem, um, but they cannot actually get you to that end point. And so I think I have personally seen from where I sit, um, this category of questions around looking for the requirements to understand the next steps that they need to take. And so I think there's a really exciting future for war game design in helping people come up with strategies and helping people come up with um, ways to get to a solution um, and to explore the next steps that they need to take. Um, but again, that might be because I'm sitting in a very specific, almost kind of categorical place um, within, within where I work. And is it different from you, uh, Sebastian, in uh, regarding the topics that you were that you were exploring within your within your work? Yeah. So, like Sawyer mentioned, we uh, she splits her time with the gaming integration team here at CNA, and all of the designers here on the GAM team. We all have our own little specialties and things that we sort of specialize in. Uh, like, for example, I do a lot of tactical, operational, sort of low strategic games. That's where my sort of bread and butter exists. And a lot of my games are future oriented about what will the future warfare be like. What, well, how do certain types of emerging technologies affect that? Uh, and looking at you know, future threats. Um, one thing I will say, sort of sidestepping the broader question is like, what are the principal means and purposes of our games? Uh, SCNA is can be boiled down to roughly five. Uh, one is to explore an idea, to sort of think of this as like the early testing phase of a concept or a notion, whether that be cyber warfare or autonomous weapons. Another one is to follow up that idea with a refinement or refining a concept. And that's really to, uh, to examine more thoroughly that you know, initial exploration. Uh, another is to uh, model a particular process, whether it's to figure out how deterrence works or how cyber warfare works or how the submarine warfare works with, you know, let's say, unmanned drones. Uh, another is to socialize a concept. That's sort of another way is to sort of help ideas be sort of po cross-pollinated across agencies and services. And lastly, the fifth way is to educate uh, players through games, is to transfer knowledge from um, the game to the players or to have what we call knowledge discovery, where we allow players to discover new concepts. And that can sort of overlap with the first one, which is to explore ideas. So principally, our four, five major ways that we do games for our sponsors is to uh, explore idea, re uh, refine a concept, socialize a concept, model a process, and educate different players. And and for you, Antoine, within within your work with the French military, um, yeah. what... I have some issues issues and questions in common that I do study. Uh, for instance, we we work about you know um, we have we uh, we use the matrix game likes uh, to you know to uh, to think about future crisis or crisis in developments. Um, Lots of people are currently working on specifics like, you know, logistics or things like that, because uh, lots of people, lots of things are changing in, in all the armies, new materials. And so you have to rethink uh, the way uh, your logistics were created and if it's still efficient at the moment. I am also producing, this is one of my main um, working efforts, uh, tactical and uh, hex encounters games. But mostly, I must say that we are also working in a more general way into an acculturation of the institution to the wargaming practices. Because, in fact, we start from scratch. Actually, we have no structures, as I said. And so we have to make simple rules, uh, not to not too gamey, but also a bit serious enough for people to, to understand what it will, if it can, that it can be sorry that it can be useful for them in their professional practices so at the moment it's really an acculturation of uh, many people in the department of defense to the use of wargame saying okay using wargame is safe guys you can do it it's not dirty and it works good um, I'm going to ask you a question regarding. So there was a question that was asked earlier by uh, Daniel uh, uh, Daniel uh, Berger or Berger. I don't know if he's French or not. Uh, so that, would, but anyway, uh, regarding uh, your 
uh, essential reading list, maybe a couple of books that you would suggest. And while you think about it, uh, so you don't have to come up with an answer straight away, you have 30 seconds because I will take that moment of you thinking about it to remind uh, everyone in the chat that uh, this stream is made possible by people who are supporting me on coffee, uh, paying for uh, the streaming services that we're using. That is actually high quality, even if uh, Antoine uh, doesn't uh, prove that point really well. It's actually now in HD thanks to that uh, uh, thanks to that system. So if you want to support the show, um, feel free to uh, donate a small amount uh, on on coffee, and I added uh, the link uh, in the chat. Um, so thanks to all the backers uh, already, and thanks to all the future backers that are uh, just about to support the channel. Uh, so do you have a couple of ideas? And I, since I can see that Antoine is moving things around, uh, and we'll start with you, Sebastian, a couple of books that you would recommend. So in terms of game design, I will recommend Peter Perla's Art of the Wargaming, which is pretty standard, but I would also recommend other game, uh, other books like uh, Graham Longley Brown out of the UK had a great textbook sort of edited, uh, edited volume with a bunch of different professional wargamers uh, submitting chapters uh, about successful wargaming. Uh, another one is uh, Rolf Costner's uh, Theory of Fun, which examines the question of what makes games immersive and uh, fun mm. for players, but also how should designers think about incorporating fun and engagement and immerse, immersion into their games. Uh, and my last sort of recommendation is to look at the topic of warfare or you know, history that you're looking at. For example, I do a lot of naval strategy and naval tactics and amphibious warfare. So I'll do a lot of reading on those topics. Helps me understand the logic and grammar of those things, but also the history. Uh, so if you're into naval wargaming and naval tactics, especially sort of in the missile age and forward, I represent Wayne Hughes Fleet Tactics, which is up to, I think, the fourth or third edition recently. So if you're interested in those things, I recommend those. Great, that's a pretty comprehensive list. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, Sawyer, any books to add? Yes, sorry, I was struggling to find um, to find mute. Um, I have sort of a not very traditional recommendation because it isn't explicitly about game design. I think um, Sebastian covered some of those great titles. Um, but I actually recommend to just about everyone who does any kind of design that they read Change by Design by Tim Brown. Um, and this is really a, a novel about design thinking methodologies. It's really about um, the experience that IDEO as a company had around the design thinking and human-centered design mindset. And it takes a product development lens in particular, um, but I recommend it because I really personally like to think of war game design as something that has a lot to learn from the product development industry um, in the sense that you really need to understand your user. In our case, our users are our players and our participants, as well as the sponsors in the case of an analytical game who are trying to get certain information or, or, or deepen their understanding, explore a concept, socialize a concept, etc. cetera. Um, but Change by Design, I think, does an excellent job of helping you think through different frameworks and methodologies for both understanding the need and then taking the need and very... Um, with a unique set of methodologies designing backwards from that need so that you can ensure that the design choices that you're making will further your goal. And that's really just about aligning objectives to outcomes. Um, but the book also really is a proponent of having fun with what you do. And I think that it's, you know, it's important not to forget that that design is a fun and almost radical act. And so I really, rec I really recommend it. Great. That's a great recommendation. And you want to end? Well, so, uh, we have the heart of wargaming here. Um, I also, uh, it's all, but it's still really great, uh, really great reading. Uh, it's the Wargaming Handbook uh, by, J by James Tuggan. Um, I play on Flick, ta Flick Tactics, actually, uh, which is a really great book. Uh, wargaming Experiences from uh, Natalia Voskovic uh, uh, is more about the way he, she uses uh, war games in a professional environment. And it's a really cool uh, reading. I also I'm also a great fan of uh, Simulating War by Phil Sabin, and I also like even more uh, his Lost Battles uh, book about the, the way to reconstruct um, books, uh, to reconstruct battles of the ancient times. And last but not least, uh, Zones of Control, uh, which was published by the MIT and edited by Pat Harrigan and Matthew Kirschenbaum. 
uh, which is a great book, lots of uh, lots of articles inside it, and uh, I cannot recommend it too highly. Great, but I think that already gives a pretty uh, extensive list of books for viewers, actually, if they want to explore more the, the topic of uh, professional wargaming. Um, so we're getting uh, beyond the hour now. So the, the, I'm just going to ask one last question just to open up a bit uh, the topic. Uh, and maybe uh, 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 maybe we'll see, maybe find another topic for a new video. But I would like to ask to, to each of you individually, where do you think were gaming in the military, but not necessarily only in the military, but professionally within the Department of Defense or uh, or for modeling international relations. Where do you see it going in the next uh, five years uh, or, or so? Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot, Sebastian, and start with you. So more than a prediction, I will say where I want uh, professional wargaming to go is to have a more emphasis on educational gaming. This is uh, Sawyer knows this where I have this is like my personal like crusade slash soapbox issue uh, where I jump on it whenever I get the chance. So um, typically right now, at least in the States, the vast majority of gaming professionally is done to analytical war, war gaming to solve particular analytical problems and support particular budgetary decisions or strategic decisions at high levels. Uh, this is not a bad thing. Um, but for me, uh, looking being a, a student of history and war gaming and war game design, uh, all the past incidents where war gaming provided profound effects for any organization was about uh, education, uh, having uh, investing in human capital and human talents, which is you know fitting given that games are about human decisions, right? So if you look at the Prussians and their the use of crick spiels and pushing it down all the way down to the regiments, to the Marine Corps' own experience with tack war in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and Dunkemp in the U.S. Army during the Cold War as well, uh, or how you know, I mean the Rens during the Western's approaches use games to uh, educate convoy commanders, right? There's a lot of emphasis on education. We don't do enough of it professionally. So I wish, you know, I mean, in the next five or ten years, that Sawyer and I will be designing more educational games for our sponsors to help uh, your know, officers and enlisted at all ranks, looking at all different problems. And and for you, Sawyer, another uh, a different perspective uh, on the development of of war gaming professionally in the in the next five years. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I do agree with Sebastian immensely because I think education was so important and such a part of me even finding this career field and developing myself as a war game designer. I would love to see that aspect of war game design grow. Um, I also would love to see an exploration uh, into what something that is related to war games, but is not purely war gaming, and, and that is the workshop environment. Um, I think there is a distinct difference between what war games do and what say design thinking workshops do. And Sebastian knows this is also sort of my soapbox is the value of design thinking methodologies, how they relate and are also outside of war game design methodologies and the relationship there. And I think that there are certain types um, of workshops that can work in conversation with war games. I really love the idea of let's have a couple of different things that are strung together. We create a formula and a conversation of analysis and including analysis. Um, and I could speak at length about the differences between war games and workshops, and I won't bore you all here, um, but I would like to see an embrace of design thinking methodologies and an emphasis on um, how those can be used to support the war game design process as well. Great, and and from your perspective, Antoine, in the in the French field in the next five years, oh, it's uh, hoping that you're 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 winning all your battles and convincing everyone that yeah, is important. yeah, I'm lucky. I'm not I'm not alone uh, fighting these battles, but uh, well, I would say that first I would like to have more women uh, involved in into uh, into war gaming, uh, into war into, into designs. So, uh, so that, that's one of the first point. When I think about the French perspective, because uh, they are not really absent uh, from the field, and uh, second, I really would like to uh, to to see uh, a lab or something like that, something like the CNA, for instance, to um, develop itself inside uh, the institution. Because for the for the time being, uh, I would say that wargaming practices in France are frail really, because uh, they are just dependent on many uh, goodwills, goodwill of peoples, 
and you know uh, people come and go inside the institution and there is no way I can be sure that in two or three or four years uh, wargaming would still be used and developed and I really would like it to 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 be to be more developed than it is uh, which is obviously not very difficult but uh, even that uh, could be washed away quite quickly because we don't have any um, structure uh, inside that does wargame uh, that uh, um, ask wargame designers to come and join and to work inside the institution so uh, this is one of the main thing and the, the main workshops I have to, uh, to 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 think about and to work on for for the next five years, I guess. Yeah, and just about your point around the presence of women in wargaming, I don't think that's necessarily only an issue in the professional side of it. I think it might be even worse in the commercial side of it. But I guess if I say more, I'm going to have uh, again some problems with. Uh, uh, a small segment of grog nerds that are really annoyed when this uh, is mentioned, but I think it's definitely something that I hope will get better in the next five years uh, dramatically uh, in both sides of the of the field. That would be great. Um, cool. But uh, I would like to thank the three of you for uh, taking the time for that discussion. I hope to see uh, hopefully all of you again for another topic or another panel that we could discuss. Uh, Sebastian, more specifically, I would like to see you again, potentially, and I'm asking you right now uh, to maybe do a demo of Literal Commander uh, in the future. I think that would be really interesting to also see like concretely a tangible example of some of the work that you are that you are doing. Uh, so if you're if you're up for it, uh, I will enjoy that uh, quite a bit. But it was great to have all of you. Thanks for taking the time um, and have a great uh, Super Bowl thingy. Uh, I'm not sure who's playing and and who you're supporting. Uh, the game doesn't make any sense to me, but it looks like you're having fun and that's great. Uh, yeah. So have a have a great uh, evening and thanks for everyone who uh, joined us uh, tonight. Uh, it was a lot of interesting comments and, and, and question in the chat. I couldn't bring all of them. If you, if you could see the list of questions that I had prepared for, for that panel and what we went through, it is a bit heartbreaking. Uh, so, but yeah, it was, it was an awesome conversation. So thanks a lot for, for that and being so open about discussing a topic that can be sensitive because we're talking about defense. Uh, so it's uh, not something that can be completely, uh, not necessarily always completely open. So I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Sawyer. And thank you, Sebastian. Great. Have a good evening, everyone. Likewise. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.